On the first Sunday in October, we started a little series of sermons in the Gospel according to Matthew, following Jesus and the disciples from the Garden of Gethsemane to Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. Uh, We've had five sermons in this series thus far, and today we come to Matthew's account of Jesus' appearance before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. Our text this morning is Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 to 26. Please follow along in your Bible as I read these verses. Then I'm going to pray and ask for God's help as we give our attention to the preaching of his precious life-giving word. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 to set the context, and then we'll take it up at verse 11. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered to him, To never a word, insomuch that the governor marvelled greatly. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask now by the work of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to understand the text of Scripture before us this morning. I pray that by the preaching of your word, you would show us your Son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. The reason why Jesus was sent to appear before Pontius Pilate is because under the Roman occupation, the power to enforce the death penalty had been taken away from the Sanhedrin, that is, from the Jewish council. According to one author, this was a common feature of Roman provincial administration. The power to administer capital punishment was the most jealously guarded of all the attributes of government. And the Roman authorities would make sure That power was theirs. The Sanhedrin delivered Jesus to Pilate, presented their accusation against him and hoped that Pilate would agree to Jesus' guilt and order his execution. We're not going to consider the interaction between Jesus and Pilate this morning, nor are we going to look at the rather curious intervention by Pilate's wife. Instead, I'm going to begin with Pilate's finding. We have four accounts of Jesus' appearance before Pilate in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew's account is less detailed than Luke's and John's, and about as detailed as Mark's. 
When we put them together, we see that Pilate realised fairly quickly that Jesus had committed no crime that was worthy of death. He concluded that Jesus was innocent and he recognised that the Jewish leaders were motivated entirely by envy. Matthew points that out in verse 18. Notice what Pilate said in response to their demand for Jesus to be crucified. Verse 25, he said, why, what evil hath he done? In Pilate's view, Jesus had committed no evil, at least none that deserved what these men were asking him to do. We also know that Pilate was concerned about maintaining the peace. And that was his top priority as the Roman governor. The last thing he wanted was civil disturbance. The last thing he wanted was for a riot to break out because that was bad for his job security. Roman governors that allowed riots to break out pretty quickly lost their job. So he also had to consider the mood of the crowd that had assembled outside his palace. The pilot knew Jesus was innocent. He knew what was going on with the Jewish leaders and he didn't want things to get out of hand in the city. We might say that he was in a bit of a pickle. So he came up with what he probably thought was a rather clever solution. A solution that would enable him to let Jesus go free and appease the Jewish leaders and the crowd outside. He would give them a choice between two men. And he was fairly confident who they would choose. This is what we're going to concentrate on this morning. Matthew tells us in verse 15 that at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. Apparently, there was a custom at the Passover feast that the Roman governor, as an act of goodwill toward the local community, would release a prisoner. The Passover was the commemoration of Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt, And perhaps the Romans thought that this was a gesture appropriate to the occasion. Evidently, Pilate was aware of this custom and he saw it as the means by which he could get Jesus off his hands. He would offer to release Jesus or another man named Barabbas. He would leave it up to the Jewish leaders and the crowd to decide. Verses 16 and 17. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Who was Barabbas? Why was he in prison? And why did Pilate offer to release him? Why was it Jesus or Barabbas? Let's think about this. For a start, Barabbas is a rather curious name. In Aramaic, which was the spoken language, it is literally Bar Abba, which means son of the father. It's a bit unusual for a proper name. Normally it would be something like Bar Jacob or Bar Nathan, son of Jacob or son of Nathan. This is son of the father. Now with that said, Abba or Abbas was probably a proper name. You might well have met Jewish men in Judea and Galilee who were called Abbas. But it's also possible that this was a nickname. Again, it's curious, son of the father. It might have indicated that this man was the son of a famous rabbi and or member of the Sanhedrin. That is, he was the son of a man who would have been addressed as father. Maybe everyone in Jerusalem knew who this man was, who was locked up in the Antonia Fortress. He was Bar Abba, the son of the father, the son of a leading man in the city. Matthew tells us that he was a notable prisoner. That is, he was notorious for his criminal activity and possibly on account of the family that he belonged to. Mark tells us that he was in prison with others who had made insurrection with him and that he had committed murder in the insurrection. And you can see the relevant verse from the Gospel according to Mark in the outline. An insurrection is an organised and usually violent act of revolt or rebellion against an established government or governing authority. 
This was what Barabbas had participated in. And it included committing murder. Perhaps he had murdered a Roman soldier or a Roman official. Or maybe he had murdered a Jewish person who worked with the Roman administration. Whatever the case, Barabbas had joined with others in a violent attempt to overthrow Roman rule in Judea. In his account, John calls Barabbas a robber. And it's an interesting Greek word. It doesn't refer to the person who breaks into your house when you're not there and steals your jewellery and your laptop. Rather, it refers to someone who plunders, someone who uses violence to rob people. Think of a bank robber, or think of the bush ranger who would hold up stagecoaches. The first century Jewish historian Josephus applies this word constantly to the zealots who were a Jewish faction that employed violent means to try to overthrow Roman rule. In the decade before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the zealots were involved in attacks where they indiscriminately murdered Greeks and Romans in Judea. Uh, they were what we would call today terrorists. This may have been what John had in mind when he applied this Greek word to Barabbas. He was a violent rebel. He was an insurrectionist. And interestingly, this is the same Greek word that is applied to the two men who were crucified with Jesus. Matthew chapter 27, verse 38. Then were there two thieves. Different English word, same Greek word. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And we can't be certain about this, but it, it may have been the case that the Romans had planned to crucify three men that day. Three men who had been involved in an insurrection. And maybe Pilate planned to do it at this time around the Passover feast when the city was full. To make an example of them. Now there were two unnamed men who were crucified. And the other was going to be Barabbas. Maybe he was the ringleader. Now, why did Pilate offer to release Barabbas? Why give the Jewish leaders this choice, Jesus or Barabbas, remembering that he wanted to let Jesus go? The answer is because Pilate thought the Jewish leaders wouldn't choose Barabbas. He thought that Jesus would be, as it were, the lesser of two evils. Sure, they didn't want Jesus to be released, but there was no way they'd choose Barabbas. Or so Pilate believed. And he probably thought that this was a very shrewd move. So why did Pilate think this? Well, this is where it gets a bit complicated. It's evident from the events that took place in the week leading up to Jesus' arrest that he had become a very popular figure in Jerusalem. Think of the crowds that went out to meet him when he rode into the city on a young donkey. It's likely that Pilate had picked up on this and he believed that the crowd that had assembled outside his palace would prefer that he release Jesus, even if there was also some sympathy for Barabbas. Most people in the crowd probably weren't overly fond of the Romans and it's likely that a man who had fought against the Romans would have some level of support or popularity but on balance Pilate believed the crowd would demand that Jesus be released for he was, as it were, the man of the moment. At the same time, and more significantly, Pilate also knew that those at the top of Jewish society, the chief priests, the members of the Sanhedrin, the aristocracy, loathed fanatics like Barabbas. Why? Because they saw them as a threat to the arrangement they had with the Romans. The arrangement that kept them in power. The arrangement that was, for many of them, very profitable. We see this concern in a passage in the Gospel according to John. There was apprehension among the ruling class about Jesus' popularity and about the possible ramifications for them. This is what John records in chapter 11, reading from verse 47. It says, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. 
And here was their concern. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. If there is a mass movement towards Jesus, if he becomes this very popular figure, the Romans will view it as a threat to their authority and they will come and take away our position. We will lose our status, our power, our prestige. The Jewish leaders, especially those in Jerusalem who oversaw the temple, didn't like anyone who they perceived would draw the ire of the Romans and thus put their position and their livelihoods at risk. And they were the privileged class. They were doing pretty well out of Roman occupation. There were advantages for them under the arrangements that then existed. They weren't going to let some violent extremist put that at risk. In the words of one author, the chief priests and the elders had no sympathy for insurrectionists because they jeopardised the status quo existing between them and the Romans. This is what Pilate was banking on, a Jesus popularity with the crowd and the Sanhedrin's distaste for men like Barabbas. As much as they hated Jesus, surely they would never choose a man like Barabbas over him, a fanatic, a murderer, a man who, if set free, would almost certainly cause more trouble and put their positions at risk. Pilate got this wrong, didn't he? He underestimated the depth and the intensity of the hatred these men had for Jesus. He underestimated the strength of their desire to see Jesus eliminated. Reading from verse 20, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. They went out and worked the crowd. Maybe they told lies about Jesus to turn the multitude against him. Or maybe they praised Barabbas. Oh, he was fighting for our freedom. He's a hero. Or maybe they threatened the people. They used their religious office to threaten the people with the judgment of God if they asked for Jesus to be released. Maybe it was a combination of all these methods. They went out and worked the crowd, persuaded The multitude. Verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? They cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, But that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is our text this morning. And as I draw the sermon to a close, I'm going to leave you with two observations. The first is this. It's very straightforward. The Jewish leaders chose a bad man over a good man. The Jewish leaders chose a bad man over a good man. They chose a man who had taken life over a man who had come to give life. They chose a man who had almost certainly told lies over a man who ever only spoke the truth. They chose a man of violence over a man of peace. They chose a man notorious for his crimes over a man famous for his compassion. Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you, they said, 
Barabbas. It's shocking that they would choose Barabbas over Jesus. And again, it's indicative of how much they hated Jesus. Actually, it's indicative of the hold that Satan had over them. And sadly, this is something that we see played out all the time. This is a feature of our world where so many are dead in trespasses and sins. Satan has such a hold over people that they choose bad men over good men. They choose bad men over Jesus. Now it is true that many are deceived into making choices that are ultimately against their own interests. But it's also true many do so willfully, for their hearts are so hardened by sin and the devil. Even knowing the risks and knowing the consequences, they choose to go the way of bad men. They choose to go the way of transgressors. They choose to pursue the pleasures of sin rather than listen to God as he is revealed in his word and by his son. There is also a subtler and more pervasive form of this behaviour and this is a judgement on my part and my judgement might be off. Uh, Maybe I'm becoming more cynical or maybe I'm becoming more wise. But every now and again, I see a a social media influencer or a famous YouTuber or a podcaster or an entertainer or a wellness expert or a politician, and I see people flocking to them, giving them their attention and their allegiance, and in some cases, their money. And it seems fairly clear to me that they're a bad person. Yes, they provide entertainment or they have some interesting things to say. Maybe some of their output is helpful, but it's apparent, at least to my eyes, that they're mostly in it for money and power. They're in it for the gold, the glory, or the girls. Maybe all three. They're almost entirely self-interested. Their focus is to build their own personal brand, to build their empire. They're a master manipulator. And often they're very coarse or very immoral in their private lives. Thousands of people, millions of people are choosing to listen to and to follow bad men and bad women. They listen to them and have no interest in Jesus. They're giving their time and their attention and even their money to people who have no interest in them, to people who are using them while ignoring the one whose promises are true, the one whose love is real, the one who gave himself for them so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This is an unhappy feature of our world, this bondage to sin, this bondage to those who are doing the devil's work, and we can only hope and pray that God, by his word and by his spirit, opens blind eyes to see the glories of Christ that he is greater, that he is wiser, that his promises are true, that his love is real, that he is the person to listen to and follow, that his nail-scarred hands are the safest and most secure of all. We can only hope and pray that God, by his word and by his spirit, softens hard hearts to receive Jesus Christ as Lord Saviour. This is our desire for those who are lost. But as we reflect on this, it would be remiss of me if I also didn't give a word of warning. For even God's people can be tempted this way, tempted to choose bad men and bad women over the Lord Jesus. We need to be so careful when it comes to who we let influence us who we give our attention to, who we give our allegiance to, who we follow online and in the world. Who are the most influential voices in your life? Who is shaping your view of the world and your priorities? Are they good men? Are they good women? Are they wise and upright? And above them all, is it Christ? Is his voice the loudest? Does he have the most influence? You're choosing to follow him. 
I hope so. The Jewish leaders chose a bad man over a good man. That's the first observation for us to think about this morning. The second is this. The good man died in the bad man's place. The good man died in the bad man's place. Jesus was nailed to a cross that was probably meant for Barabbas. It was Barabbas who was going to die that day with those two other men, but Jesus took his place. Jesus is condemned and Barabbas is pardoned. Jesus dies and Barabbas lives. And what has God in his wisdom and in his sovereignty given us? He's given us a picture of the gospel. The Jewish leaders in the crowd make this terrible choice. They behave so wickedly and God, as it were, turns it around into something so glorious. One of the clearest illustrations of salvation in the Bible. Jesus, the good man, died in the place of Barabbas, the bad man. And what the Bible teaches is that on the cross, Jesus suffered and died for all the bad men, for all the bad women. He died in the place of sinners. And that's all of us. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. All our transgressions, all our disobedience, all the bad things we've done, all the dirty things, the things we're ashamed of, the things we regret. He laid all of our guilt and our sin upon his son, Jesus Christ. And he suffered the punishment. The punishment that we deserve. In my place condemned he stood, the hymn writer says, sealed my pardon with his blood. The Apostle Peter expresses this truth so clearly when he says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. The the just one, the righteous one, suffered and died for the unjust. For those who are unrighteous, that's us. The good person dies for all the bad people. Why? So that he might bring them to God. So that he might reconcile them to God. He suffers and dies in order to remove what was between them and having a relationship with God. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. This is the only way that any of us get to God. The only way that any of us get to heaven, it is only through Jesus Christ and what he accomplished by his life, death and resurrection. He is the only way, the only saviour, the only substitute there is. Jesus takes our place like he did for Barabbas. He dies the death that we deserve or we die the death we deserve. We die and suffer the punishment for our sins forever in hell. They're the only two outcomes. What Jesus accomplished on the cross becomes ours. He becomes ours, our saviour, our substitute, when we trust in him. We are saved from the penalty of our sin. We are saved from everlasting death through faith in Christ and through faith alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I hope this morning you can say, yes, pastor, I believe. I believe that Jesus has taken my place, that he died for my sins on the cross and rose again. I know that because of him I am forgiven and clean and right with God forever and I am looking forward to seeing my Lord in heaven one day. I hope you can say that. I hope you are sure of that. And if you're not... It's okay to say so. It's okay to say so. I hope you'll say so. This is the place. 
This is the family where you can share something like that. If you're not sure, if you have questions, please come and talk to me after the service. Or if you're a young person, talk to your mum or your dad. Or talk to someone else here who you know is a Christian. We'd love to speak more about this, more about Jesus, more about his love and the salvation that can be yours. Coming back to our passage here in the Gospel according to Matthew and to these two observations. The Jewish leaders chose a bad man over a good man and the good man died in the bad man's place. This is what we see. And really at a deeper level, we see just how hard and wicked men's hearts can be. While at the same time we see the wonderful plan of God for our salvation. We see men at their worst and God at his most glorious. May he richly bless us with his word this morning. And may he help us to keep our eyes on his beloved son. Amen.